Adolescence in any culture is that unique period in life when an individual is in the middle of the difficult transition from the dependence of childhood to the independence of adulthood. For many, that transition, like most transitions, is not smooth. It is filled with ups and downs, experimentation, trial and error, along with some trials and successes. Then add trying to navigate adolescence when you live in a culture that is different from that of your family and you predictably get a difficult challenge that is being experienced by thousands of today's youth in our state and throughout the country. What are some of the challenges facing the racial and ethnic diverse group of adolescents who make up a big and important part of Minnesota's population? Stay tuned and you'll find out on today's episode of A Public Health Journal. Welcome to A Public Health Journal, a program that explores public health issues facing our society today and tomorrow. The host of the show is Dr. Ed Ellinger, Commissioner of Health for the State of Minnesota. A Public Health Journal is sponsored by the Minnesota Department of Health and the Hennepin County Human Services and Public Health Department, all working together towards the goal of healthy people living in healthy communities. Welcome to A Public Health Journal. Today we're going to examine some of the developmental issues facing adolescents who come from a culture that is different than that of the majority culture. We'll be looking at the stresses that adolescents face as they try to fit into a society dominated by people with a culture different than that of their parents. In particular, we'll be looking at the issues facing Latino youth in Minnesota. Joining me in that discussion is Dr. Maria Veronica Zveta, an adolescent medicine physician with the Hennepin County Medical Center. Dr. Zveta is medical director of the Hennepin County Medical Center's East Lake Clinic and a provider at Akiparati, a clinic-based development program for Latino youth and their families. Akiparati means here for you. Veronica, welcome to our program. Thank you so much. I'm for glad you're here, here for us. <laughs> I'm glad that I'm here. I'm glad that I'm here. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, we, adolescence in general is an important uh, period in, in life and a difficult period for lots of folks. And then you have a cultural component on it. But let's start just with adolescence. Why are adolescents important? You're an adolescent physician. Why should we pay attention to adolescents? <clears throat> First of all, because they are the future. So they are the future and they are the one who are going to be shaping the society. But at the same time, it's a very vulnerable population, as we know, because everything, everything is changing around you and you're trying to figure out who you are and how you fit in that society. Sometimes I like to think about them like, like this sponge or this barometer where you absorb all these pressures or, or discussions or stressors that are, are, are there in the society uh, and somehow reacting to that in a passive way or in, you know, or in a very active way. Mm -hmm. So, and it's very sort of like vulnerable at the same time because my perspective on that is like, we have done such an amazing job, um, sort of like coaching parents and coaching um, newborns or protecting newborns or nurturing newborns and toddlers and school agers. And we dropped the ball. Uh, and things changes for the teens, you, the same changes are there for the family as a unit. And no one is there sort of like supporting them up and coaching them mm -hmm. through that transition. And it's also a, it's a period where, you know, when they're children, their parents are speaking for them. And then a little bit later on, they're speaking for themselves. Yes. But at this point in time, sometimes it's their parents and sometimes it's them. And how do you sort of balance that? Where do you get the right appropriate uh, parental influence? Yep. And, and when do you let the, the adolescent make decisions on his or herself? Yep. And that's, that's, such, a, that's just such an amazing point. Like even when you're like working f as, a, as a medical professional um, with, with a teenager, let's say like they have a chronic illness, that's particularly the point. It's like how you help this family to 11, so, sort of through this adolescenthood, sort of like to transfer the power, but also sharing and role modeling for that teenager, what are the skills that they need to use to take care of themselves. So that at some moment, kind of like you're coaching, 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 at some moment you let go. And so we usually talk about that, the concept of coaching or being the coach. Mm. Like from now and then you need to let them go and play in the field, come back, let's talk about it. Okay. Uh, just to transfer that, right. the skills. So then you add people from a different culture, adolescents who either come from another culture or who have been born in this country <clears throat> Uh, with parents who come from a different culture. Yeah. What stresses does that add to adolescence? Well, it gets more complicated because it adds a new whole transition that happens differently 
both ends of the family. So for once, you have the, the teen, let's say like most of our teen or a lot of the teens that we see, they come middle adolescenthood or sometime late childhood. So they get into the, the school system and the school system help them to get into the flavor of the culture and understand the culture pretty well, but then create this gap with the parents that are not, that have, that they don't have the same sort of like speed uh, on understanding or navigating the, the new culture, the system of the new culture. Mm -hmm. So it brings, not only brings the stressors to both of them that they need to, to learn how to navigate new systems, new rules, that they need to decode by themselves because there's no much explanation about culture and rules and, and what is right or on what is expected and what is not. But it's the fact that the speed happen at a different, at a, at a different type of speed, uh, and that creates a bigger gap. So it's not only the, the generational gap that you already have, mm -hmm. but now it's like the cultural gap on top of it. Well, and I would suspect that the adolescents know English better, and, and, and so the power changes, the power differential changes. They have more power than you know, Anglo youth in this, in this country because their parents don't speak the dominant language. That's exactly right, and that's exactly the point. And, and you'll see later on, like, when we design the, po the program, one of the points that we're trying to make is like, this, the, the way we see adolescent care in our program is like, the way that we think it should be done by, through any, by providing care to any kind of teenager, not only minority teenager, but particularly when you're working with migrant or refugee family, it's kind of crucial that you provide to support to that parent because of that. Like mm -hmm. parents are kind of like disempowered. And there's a different factor that we haven't talked about. So this is like kind of like, we talk about the family context, but we haven't talked about that whole family going into a sort of like a mainstream culture mm -hmm. where most of the time they are disempowered or disengaged or they don't feel like they belong for different reasons, for internal reasons, but also sometimes for external reasons. And so it's like how to put all those ingredients mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. And how do, how do you deal with the fact that, you know, the parents really want to continue uh, their culture or instill their, their main culture into their kids and the kids are really growing up in a different culture. How do you balance that in a, in a way that's really healthy for both the adolescent and for the parents yep. and the family? So what the research shows, um, and it's mainly kind of like across culture, but what the research shows with so look, when a, when a teenager is developing, and at some moment, usually it's in late adolescenthood, like this, they develop this identity, this cultural identity. And the best scenario is like when they get the skills to navigate the both cultures. Mm. So like they're grounded in their own culture and they feel pride, proud about it. So they know who they are, they know where the roots are coming, they know where their families are coming, but they know exactly where they are living and what the difference means. So they know how to play what worth rules or values play in one culture and what rules or values should play in the other culture so they can fit and they can function and they can be successful. But in order to get there, you also need the parents to change, also to see, to have that view, to have that view like, like it's okay, like they need to develop those skills, uh, not forgetting who they are or sort of like honoring their own values, but embracing the values of the new culture. And it doesn't mean like the, the parent has to go change their identity too. It just means like the parent has to be, have that awareness and, and to have that feeling like it's safe and it's good for them and the family. Mm -hmm. So that's why even when you're doing like a healthcare home, like um, this concept of navigating system, it's crucial. And having people to help you navigate systems, meaning healthcare, meaning schools and education, it's key. Mm -hmm. Well, that's one of the things I really want to talk about is what are the supports that are out there and, and what, how can uh, adolescents from different cultures get that support? And we'll talk about that in our next segment, but first we need to take a little break. Excellent. We'll be back right after this message. Did you know kids who play outdoors have healthier lungs? Totally. Did you know that boys that play with dolls make better husbands? My son has lots of dolls. But did you know terry cloth diapers breathe better? I did. Mm -hmm. it's totally true. Oh, yeah, yeah. Did you guys know statistically friendly kids have more friends? Yeah. That's obvious. Did you know most people think they're using the right car seat for their kid, but they're not? Parents who really know it all know for sure that their child is in the right seat. 
Visit safercar.gov slash the right seat to make sure your child is protected. Welcome back. We're talking about adolescent development among adolescents from different cultures than the mainstream culture. And we're talking uh, with Dr. Maronica uh, Zveta from Akiparati uh, program of the Hennepin County Medical Center. Dr. Zveta does, uh, what are you know, some of the supports? You know, in in the, the mainstream culture, if you have a mental health issue, you, know, you have a whole bunch of places where you can go. If you have a sexually transmitted infection or you're having problems with relationships or if you're having problems in school or you know, all of the things, there's a, there's a whole network that have been, has been grown up and built up around supporting youth. It may not be as good as it should be, but it's, it's there. What about you know, Latino youth or you know, youth from other cultures coming in? They don't have that sort of network of, of community. How do you deal with that? So, I guess the most important thing is like when you're working with with youth and communities from <clears throat> from a different culture, you you get in your mind this this awareness also of health equity and, and, and health disparity and how important it is to start creating that sort of like system of care. Um, and at the beginning, like and I'm, and I'm just speak about myself, like when you start working with with that community in particular, the, the most important thing is like to overcome that feeling of loneliness that you have as a provider, that I cannot imagine how it might be feeling on the other side, and I start creating that sort of like system of care, and it's usually working with the people like that they can put their trust, and it's kind of like with community centers, and, and it's identifying someone at the school who have a, a great connection with the students be mainly because of cultural concordance uh, or be mainly because they just can connect with people well. Um, maybe because they went through some sort of like uh, migration experience in their life and they know what it takes to overcome that. Um, but it's truly sort of like a public health matter. It's like how you put in place the same systems or, or infrastructure that you have for the sort of like a mainstream population and, and how to create that that seamless continuum of care that it's so difficult. Um, and it takes extra time, I have to say. Like, so when we started delivering services with, with our clients, we were looking about that kind of like system change. Uh, well, we've, we've got a little video that comes from your, your clinic uh, that sort of shows us in a story form, you know, in a, in a way of an individual, how this all works. So maybe you could explain, what are we going to be seeing in this, this little video? So this is um, a video that it talk about patient-centeredness, and it was developed by Hennepin uh, Art Hospital. They were putting together, they, they were moving a truly system-wide effort to make family and patient-centeredness the, the how in our whole system. And Akiparati was chosen as an example of that uh, because of our family and patient centeredness from from the beginning. Hmm. All right, so this this shows that that patient centered care, and I think it brings up a lot of the issues that that uh, adolescents of color really face in our mm -hmm. country. So let us let's run the video. Lo que me hizo venir a la clínica a ver a un doctor era que yo estaba embarazada y pues me decían que necesitaba cuidado, no tenía que seguir con mis cuidados prenatales. Mi experiencia al ver a la doctora Verónica, ella cuando entró al cuarto, ella me dijo mi nombre es la doctora Verónica, eh, yo voy a ser tu doctora de aquí en adelante. Me dio un abrazo y me dijo que le daba mucho gusto en conocerme. Me decía, Patri, ¿tú estás en la escuela? Yo le dije, no. Pero, o sea, esa fue lo, lo de mi primer cita. Yo me sentía muy sorprendida porque, siendo una doctora ella, ¿cómo ella me iba a, a animar a mí? Pero yo ya pensaba en eso, porque yo al estar embarazada, yo decía, mi hijo, eh, ¿Cómo yo le voy a ayudar si yo no me educo? Yo he, particip he participado en el programa de Aquí para Ti desde que ella, um, desde que nos empezamos a ver y ella me metió al programa, pero ellas eran mis, 
eh, yo siempre, siempre pensaba, ellas, ellas eran mi porra. Ellas eran las que siempre estaban, ellas sabían que yo iba a terminar mis, mi, mis estudios, lo que yo estaba cursando. Ellas me decían, tú vas a terminar, nosotras ya sabes, te apoyamos, nosotras siempre estamos ahí. Bueno, yo he logrado terminar la high school. Yo vine a una cita regularmente, hablamos. Estaba esperando que, como al momento, entonces yo le tenía mucha confianza. Eh, y yo le dije, doctora, necesito ayuda. Dijo, dime, Patri. Yo le dije, es mi mamá. Le dije que ella tenía un problema. Y ella me abrazó y me dijo, Patri, el camino es largo, pero yo te voy a ayudar. Mi relación con la doctora Verónica comenzó cuando acompañé a mi hija aquí a la clínica. Por medio de ella, este, pues no sé, ¿verdad? Mi hija ya le había platicado de mi caso y yo en esos momentos yo lo tomé como un engaño para que, que ella para mí en realidad fue como, como un ángel, que yo nunca pensé que hubiera una persona, que alguien que me pudiera ayudar. Estaba, tenía una fuerte depresión, mucha anemia sobre todo, tenía mucha anemia, depresión y otro mal que me aquejaba, ¿verdad? De, tenía una un problema muy fuerte de de alcoholismo cuando yo venía a mi tratamiento la doctora siempre siempre me trataba muy bien mamita tú eres un tú eres como un ave fénix una ave tan hermosa, dice, que tú vas a poder, tú puedes. Y yo le decía, no puedo, no puedo. Y míreme, ahora llevo más de dos años estando. Siempre cuando uno habla de, de herencia a los hijos, siempre uno se le viene a la mente el dinero. Pero pienso que la herencia que uno le pueda dar a los hijos es la educación, el respeto, el amor, la confianza y que sean los mejores, los mejores en la vida. Veronica, that was an amazing story. I, do all your patients get that kind of care? <laughs> we try, and I think like, we honestly try and thrive for everyone to have like the best care uh, evidence evidence based uh, patient centered trust and, and, and care that they can get. Um, I always have I always say uh, or, or make a remark after the video talking about how amazing this patient was. And that my only my only work there was kind of like to reflect back And someone was saying, well, that's an intervention in itself. But I think that's also the feel of adolescent medicine, being so strength-based um, and being able to, most of our teens, because of many factors, sometimes have like lower expectations everywhere else. So when they come to us and we, you do that, mm -hmm. that you say like, you're so amazing. You, you, you can achieve this, you can achieve that. How can we help you? How, how can we support that dream? Uh, it, It's energy. Yeah. And well, the, the, in this video, it, it highlighted to me the fact that when we look at what creates health, medical care, the, the actual treatment kind of thing, is only about 10%. Yes. It's behavior, it's social it's conditions, yes. it's the environment. Uh, and those are the things that take a lot more time to deal with. And, and that's where you need a relationship. Yes. But it's also true, like, even, like, 
or my perspective, like even even it's only that 10 percent, it's like if you increase the gap through that healthcare, like the Institute of Medicine have shown, that's sort of like a really bad stuff because mm -hmm. sort of like the first rule is like do not harm. So and a new development needs to be embedded in a healthcare system too. Why not? Mm -hmm. So it's true, it's great for community work, it's great in the school, but it's also great for healthcare. And I truly believe sort of like this patient-centeredness. Uh, kind of like we in, a, in adolescent healthcare were at the front of it. So now it's like that's where it's medicine currently like going mm -hmm. and hopefully keep going. Right. Well, this is part of Occupara T. Mm -hmm. It's a clinic within yes. a clinic. Yes. Tell us a little bit about Occupara T. When did it start? Uh, why did it start? So mm -hmm. Occupara T was funded uh, we started June 2002 uh, thanks to Eliminating Health Disparity Initiative Grant from uh, OMMH, MDH. OMMH is Office of Minority and Multicultural Health and, and that was like the, the start and, and sparked sort of like the whole, I think we can say revolution of, of Akiparati. And what Akiparati is, it's sort of like a, what we do, it's, it's parallel family care. So we follow the family going through that transition of adolescenthood and we provide support for the parent and the teen. And you can come as a parent alone, you can come as a teen alone or you can come together. We have confidentiality in a meal. But we explain confidentiality in a very, diff kind of like in a different way, in a family-centered way. So we explain the rules and we sort of like teach them because most of them don't know like it's it's a teen right and it's by law but we say that like it's not against the parents like we are there just to support the parents and we want to be the other significant adult on the teen's life but also on the parents life mm -hmm. and that makes the whole difference mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. it's mainly created sort of like with that idea of inequities so we put like social determinant of health mental health and and overall health at the same level and they have the same attention. Mm -hmm. So why was there a need for Occupy uh, There's no, there's a need because there was no system that were able to, to address or to take, to take in consideration the, their cultural values, to deal with infrastructural thing, things like uh, access of care, because most of our immigrant population don't have at, at the same level, and Latinos are the ones who, who suffer n not having access to care the most. But for one, it's, we take the values of the, of the family that we're serving, and m all of us, the whole team, it's Latino, bicultural, bilingual, so it's sort of like that cultural concordance that Institute of Medicine talk about, like it's key on predicting the outcomes of the patients that we're serving. Mm -hmm but also because it helps knowing the values. Or even if you don't know the value, it helps getting in contact with those values or aware of those values just to provide the services. And because there have, there's nothing like that. When we were talking today about this system of care, like it doesn't exist for immigrant families, well, this is it for the Latino families. And we can tell because we have become a referral center. We have patients from all over, sometimes all over Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Uh, providing care and sometimes like guiding someone else uh, in a different part, some, some other provider in a different part of town, sort of like with the key things like they need to take in consideration and sending them back to them. How important is it to have somebody, a provider from the same culture? Um, I will talk, I will use their words um, and they say like 80% of our patients, they say like it's extremely important to have someone from their culture and that it's extremely important to have someone um, who is bilingual. So the research shows that for different reasons, and I believe like one is like that kind of like mutual understanding, but for us the main is like role modeling. Like not only you're doing an intervention right there just by showing them like you can do it, like someone like you can do it, that you can achieve. And I was just listening to NPR and there's like a teacher talking about uh, education inequities and they're coming to that same conclusion like in order to reduce that gap you, you need to reduce that gap also on those providing the services because that particularly for a teenager the, that that role modeling 
and and seeing like someone like you from your own culture with your own values was able to get there, it's the force. Right. Well, yeah, our, our state is, is becoming increasingly diverse very, very quickly. And so having a workforce that really matches that is, is really important. So I'm hoping that you're encouraging some of the teens that you're working with to, to go into healthcare. Please, we have like, we have like several of them. The most fascinating things like I have like, uh, we follow our teens and we follow when they, them when they get pregnant. So now I've seen them and their children. I have like a cohort of like five year older who say like they're going to be physician, <laughs> like Dr. Veronica and I love it. But we try, we have a college connector that it's been key, key. So health um, education disparities and health disparities are they are overwhelmingly affecting the same population. And particularly for a teen, you need to make the connection because with one, you're going to solve the other in a way. So having a college connector, it's been the most important probably uh, change that we have done in the last three years in Akipa at team because it helps with everything else. Well, we're, we're running out of time. So, I mean, this is many, many things that we could still talk about, but this has been wonderful. Thanks for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. Good. And I'll be back with a closing comment right after this message. decorating their little brother. Brushing for two minutes now can save your child from severe tooth pain later. Two minutes, twice a day. They have the time. Adolescence is that sometimes difficult period in life when one gives up the dependence of childhood and embraces the independence of adulthood. It is a stressful time for both the adolescent and the adults with whom the adolescent must interact. Many adults would just as soon see kids skip the teenage years and get right to adulthood. That way they could ignore the moods and rebellion and needs of the adolescent. But adolescence is a normal and necessary developmental stage. Without that phase of development, the human race would also stop developing. And today, when our world is changing dramatically in almost every aspect, technology, environment, racial diversity, demographics, economics, and many more, how adolescents react to major social changes may be of great value to all of us. They may show us the way to understand and manage the change that confronts us. In other words, we need adolescents more than we realize. So despite the difficulties of this stressful age of life, we need to give adolescents more attention, not less. The teens will appreciate it, and eventually so will all of us and all of us will be better for it. That's all for today, thanks for watching. I hope you can join us again next time on a Public Health Journal.